Good afternoon, everyone, again, and welcome. If you are here for the 10610 Shorefront Parkway rezoning and large scale special permit application scoping meeting, you are in the right place. Uh, we are now live streaming to YouTube for those of you joining us uh, through the live stream, just making sure that everything is working properly before we kick off. Um, thanks, everyone. We'll be getting started in about five minutes at 2 p.m. Speak to you all shortly. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. You are tuning in to the remote public scoping meeting for the 10610 Shorefront Parkway Rezoning and Large Scale General Development, or LSGD, uh, proposal. For the record, the City Environmental Quality Review, or SEEKER number, is 24DCP098Q. My name is Stephanie Shalou, and I'm the Director of the Environmental Assessment and Review Division, or EARD. Uh, Evren Olker Kajar, the Deputy Director of EARD, will co host today's meeting. I want to thank everyone uh, for taking time out of your busy days for joining us for this remote meeting. Um, and I want to emphasize that we will hear from everyone who is registered to speak uh, during this meeting. The meeting will remain open until everyone who has registered to speak has had an opportunity to do so. Uh, we also welcome written comments and testimony. Uh, the written comment period will extend through 5 p.m. Monday, April 8th. 15th, 2024, and we provide written comments the same attention and consideration as those heard live at this meeting. Uh, for those of you that have already submitted written comments, thank you, and please continue to do so to share your thoughts. Next slide. We will now proceed to the public scoping meeting for 10610 Shorefront Parkway Rezoning and LSGD. Again, for the record, let me note that the City Environmental Quality Review or seeker number for the application is 24DCP098Q. Today is April 4th, 2024, and the time is approximately 2.01 p.m. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Stephanie Shalou. I'm the Director of the Environmental Assessment and Review Division of the New York City Department of City Planning. I will be chairing today's scoping meeting. The City Department of City Planning is acting on behalf of the City Planning Commission as the lead agency for the proposal's environmental review. The, as lead agency, the department will be responsible for overseeing the preparation and completion of the proposal's draft environmental impact statement, or EIS. Next slide. Joining me are several colleagues of mine from the Department of City Planning. As I mentioned, Evren Olker Kajar is the Deputy Director of EARD and will step in uh, if I have any technical issues on my end. Uh, from our Climate and Sustainability Planning Division, we're joined by Deputy Director Brendan Pilar. Stacey Barron is the Project Manager uh, for this proposal in the Environmental Assessment and Review Division. And Elisa Nermancha is the project manager for the proposal in the department's Queen's office. I'll also mention that during today's meeting, we're joined by many DCP staff members working in the background to ensure that today's meeting runs smoothly. So thanks everyone uh, for your assistance. Uh, together, we're here to receive your comments on the draft scope of work for the 10610 Shorefront Parkway rezoning and LSGD proposal. The draft scope of work identifies the subjects that will be analyzed in the upcoming draft environmental impact statement or DEIS and describes the methodologies that will be used in those analyses. The draft scope of work is available on the Department of City Planning's website and on our ZAP search page. Next slide. The purpose of today's public scoping meeting is to allow public participation in the preparation of the DEIS at the earliest stage of the environmental review process. Specifically, scoping allows the public to help shape the DEIS before it is written. Towards that end, the department as lead agency will receive verbal testimony on the draft scope of work today from elected officials, government agencies, representatives of the community board, and the general public. As I mentioned, we also welcome written comments on the draft scope of work. Those can be submitted through 5 p.m. Monday, April 15th, 2024. Next slide. At the end of the written comment period, the department as lead agency will review all comments, those we hear today, as well as any written comments we've received. After carefully reviewing all comments, the department will decide what changes, if any, need to be made to the draft scope of work, and we will issue a final scope of work. It is the final scope of work that serves as the basis for preparing the DEIS. Next slide. Today marks the beginning of the, the comment period on the draft scope of work. Uh, no decisions will be made today regarding the draft scope draft scope of work. Again, the purpose of today's meeting is to allow the public to provide their comments on the draft scope of work to allow the department to listen to those comments. As a reminder, we will hear from everyone who wishes to speak today. Next slide. 
Uh, I'll now focus on the structure of today's meeting, which will be divided into three parts. During the first part, the applicant team will make a brief presentation describing the 10610 Shorefront Parkway rezoning and LSGD proposal. The applicant team will then provide a brief summary of the environmental review and the draft scope of work. This will be around 20 minutes. Then during the second part of the meeting, the department will hear comments from elected officials, government agencies, and folks speaking on behalf of the community board. And then during the final part of the meeting, we'll hear from members of the general public. Next slide. A few logistics for today's meeting. Again, this protocol is intended to ensure that everyone has a chance to speak today. If you wish to speak and plan to access the meeting online using a computer, tablet, or smartphone, please remember to register online through the NYC Engage portal, through the upcoming meetings page, by selecting the 10610 Shorefront Parkway Rezoning and LSGD Public Scoping Meeting. A link to join us and provide your testimony will be emailed to you after you have completed the registration process, and we will add you to our speakers list. Next slide. When it's your turn to speak, your name will be called and you will be granted temporary speaking privileges by the Department of City Planning staff working in the background. Uh, you will be promoted to panelist, which will allow you to unmute your microphone and the ability to turn on your camera if you wish. Please note that promoting speakers can take a moment, so we ask that everyone is patient during this process. Once your name has been called, we'll help you unmute your microphone and you'll be asked to convey your remarks. To allow us to hear from everyone who wishes to speak, we will limit speaking to three minutes. If you're participating online, a three minute countdown clock will run on the screen. At the three minute mark, your time will expire and you will be asked to conclude your remarks. As a reminder, if you choose to turn on your camera, we will be able to see you. As an additional note of instruction for those of you joining us by phone, if you wish to provide testimony via telephone, please select star nine when I prompt you. Please listen for me to call out the last three digits of your phone number, at which point you'll be given the temporary ability to share your testimony. You'll need to press star six to unmute your telephone and we'll be able to hear you speak during this meeting. When your testimony is complete or your three minutes have expired, whichever comes first, you'll need to press star six again to mute yourself. We would like to encourage dial-in participants who are joining by phone uh, who wish to provide testimony to register through our dial-in participant hotline that was displayed at the beginning of this meeting. Uh, please note that muting and unmuting registered speakers does take a moment, so we, we appreciate everyone's patience. Um, on to time limits. Speakers from the general public have three minutes, as I mentioned, to give testimony. There are a few exceptions to the three-minute time limit. Elected officials, for example, are given the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. To those of you joining us on the live stream and wishing to testify, please be mindful of potential background noise during your testimony. Make sure that the live stream is muted when you're in Zoom beginning your testimony to avoid hearing an echo. Next slide. Uh, if you wish to submit written testimony, it can be submitted to our mailing address uh, shown on the screen here at the Department of City Planning. Uh, our mailing address is 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Attention to myself, Stephanie Shalou. You can also email us comments, as many of you have already. Uh, the email address specifically for this proposal is 24DCP098 q underscore dl at planning.nyc.gov. This information can be found on the NYC Engage portal as well as the Department of City Planning's website, nyc.gov slash planning. We will accept comments as a reminder through Monday, April 15th, 2024 at 5 p.m. Next slide. All right. If you missed any of the instructions on how to participate today, please visit uh, NYC Engage at www.nyc.gov slash NYC Engage for instructions on how to participate and provide testimony. At this point, we will now move to the first part of the meeting where the applicant team will provide an overview of the proposed project. Uh, so I will now turn it over to Eric Fath of the applicant team. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Eric Vath. I'm partner of Goldman Harris. We are land use uh, attorneys for the applicant. Next slide, please. 
Our agenda is laid out in the slide in front of you. First, I'm going to introduce the applicant team. Uh, we're going to provide a, a brief project overview, uh, including zoning. Uh, then we'll have the architect, who I will introduce, uh, run through the building design and some of the open space, followed by the environmental consultant describe, describing the draft scope of work. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the applicant team. Uh, the applicant is Shorefront 4 LLC on behalf of the owners. Alma is are the property managers. Uh, the architect who was joining me in presenting today is Jay Valgora. He's principal and founder of Studio V Design and Planning. Uh, I represent Goldman Harris Land Use Council. Uh, we're also uh, on the applicant team. We have Cozen O'Connor. They're handling government relations. Uh, you will also hear today from the environmental consultant, Philip Aviva and Associates. Uh, Joseph McKenzie will be presenting. And lastly, the landscape architect is Ken Smith Workshop. Next slide, please. Let's move on to a project overview and the zoning. Next slide. The applicant is requesting several related land use actions to facilitate the proposed project, which the architect and the environmental consultant will share with you. These actions allow for a cohesive site plan for the entire block. It will benefit the existing residents while permitting more housing and a wider range of community facility and retail uses. These new housing opportunities will provide both housing and jobs to benefit the Rockaways and the city. The complete list of actions described in this slide is a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from what it is currently now an R5 district to an R6-1 district. And there will be a portion of the site, which we will show you in the coming slides, which will have a C23 commercial overlay. Again, this permits more housing opportunities and a mix of uses, including residential, commercial, and community facility. We are also proposing zoning text amendments. Uh, this will establish the R61 general residential district but it also create a mandatory inclusionary housing area. And this requires the development of affordable housing. Lastly, we're proposing a large scale general development. Uh, it allows for, think of it as creating a better site plan. And within that site plan, it allows the applicant to modify certain regulations, including building height and setbacks, distance between buildings, that facilitate the proposed configuration of the buildings on the site. Next slide, please. Uh, this existing zoning map gives you a wider context of the zoning in along Rockaway Beach. The project area is indicated and outlined in red. As you can see, there are existing R6 districts to the east along the boardwalk. Next slide. This slide presents the proposed zoning of the project area. On the left is the existing, on the right is the proposed indicated in red. Uh, as you can uh, see, there's a R61 proposed and indicated it by a hatch, uh, there is a commercial overlay, a C23, which extends along Beach 108th Street to the west and Rockaway Beach Boulevard to the north. And with that context, uh, next slide, please. I would like to introduce and uh, pass the baton to the architect, Jay Val Valgora of Studio V. He's gonna walk you through the proposed development uh, and he'll run through his design and uh, give you a complete overview of the project. There we are. Uh, Jay? Thank you, Eric. So I'm Jay Valgora, and I'm the founder and principal of Studio V Design and Planning. I'm an architect. I'm a planner. I've had the privilege of working in all five boroughs and many other places along the 526-mile waterfront of New York City. And, uh, you know, the Rockaways is a really special community, 
And so we're hoping you know, to create something that will be very special there. Here you can see an overall site plan uh, that shows the project as a whole. And I'm going to come back and explain like the rationale and the thinking and the design elements. And most of all, show you a series of illustrative renderings that show before and after views. So you can really see how we can try to create something that will be an outstanding mixed use residential development with beautiful open spaces, green areas, and a new higher level of resiliency for the whole Rockaways. I want to begin by saying that the three existing buildings were really historically, we'll show you, uh, done by Robert Moses, and they were part of urban renewal. So these three kind of slab tower blocks set within a parking lot, in many ways, is a planning model that we consider outdated. But it's also very important to say that we are going to preserve every single building, every single residence that's there and not touch them. But we're showing how we can create a new series of buildings around them to achieve all the goals that Eric described. And I'll take you into some of the detail of that. The next slide, please. So, you know, first of all, Eric went through some of the facts. And these are basically the overall facts of the project, and they'll be put into the record. There is existing about three quarters of a million of residential floor area. And the final project, it's a very large project because it encompasses what was originally five or six blocks originally would be about 2.1 million. We're adding considerable new retail. This is a real issue because Robert Moses actually intentionally removed much of the retail from the Rockaways. He actually went in the record and said he wanted to take it out. And we want to put back small local retail that serves the local community. We're also proposing new community facility. I'll get into that in more detail, which includes a public aquatic center to teach swimming to children and have senior programs. The total number of residential units that exist today is 771. So we're looking proposed to have a total of 2,331. Parking and cars are very important. So even though this is probably one of the most transit-oriented sites in the entire Rockaways, it has both direct access to a subway, which is immediately adjacent to the site, and to the new ferry system, which is literally a block away, which actually connects all the way you know, to the five boroughs. We also recognize that cars are very important. And so we're taking those parking lots, but we're actually increasing the amount of cars here from 641 to 1,822. So, you know, this shows you the overall approach as to how we're looking at the project. Let's show you what it looks like. So first, we'll start with a little bit of history and how we arrived at the design. If we go to the next, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, if you can go back. So the other thing is the community benefits. So we're looking to create a resilient design, greater housing choice, extensive gardens and greenery, taking basically what's asphalt today for the most part, taking Beach 108th Street, which used to be one of the most important retail corridors and actually bring it back to a year round local retail place that leads to the beach, an aquatic center that will have both senior and youth programs uh, and local jobs, economic development, as well as frankly, an expression of confidence in the Rockaways and its future. Next, I'm gonna focus on the resiliency a lot later too. So building site and open space design, keep going. So historic Rockaway is like this. Next slide. So originally, this is actually what the site looked like. It was full of small individual buildings. As a matter of fact, the block next to us on Beach 108th Street is the largest extent collection of those kind of smaller houses and bungalows that really define this village-like character of the Rockaways as it evolved. Next. And really, there are two elements of housing that make up the Rockaways today. On the left is the predominant model, which is really what you know, the buildings that are existing on the site are like. There are a series of towers that were erected in the 50s, 60s that are these kind of slab tower forms. And on the right, you can see the traditional bungalow forms of which still, you know, handfuls and the block next to us still exist. Next. And here you can see examples where we really looked at, you know, these wonderful small scaled housing. And this was an inspiration to us. And we wanted to bring back elements of this into the design, which originally completely filled the site before Robert Moses leveled them all. And we want to bring a series of these in to include for retail, community facilities, smaller scaled housing. Next. And yet the tower form actually is the predominant residential form in the Rockaways today. And many of the residents who live here and love living in this current complex live in buildings like this. And so we would also create new towers. But for us, we would create newer 21st century models that are more beautiful, more green, more sustainable, and more resilient. So really a combination, if you will, of the tower forms that already set the scale for this neighborhood and this community in the Rockaways, and the bungalow forms, which are much more finely grained to kind of mitigate the scale of the towers and to blend the two together instead of standing them in the parking lot. Next. So here's a diagram that shows kind of the history of that. Please keep going. 
So this is actually what the neighborhood originally looked like. We reconstructed this from the historic photos. It was five or six blocks. Remember, this is kind of a mega block that was all torn down by Robert Moses. So it originally had streets through it, smaller buildings and so forth. These were all kind of wiped out. Next. And so it was replaced with this, which were three slab buildings set in the midst of parking lots with kind of a fence around it. And adjacent to one of the most beautiful beaches, you can see actually that row of that block of bungalows in the lower left that actually still exists. Next. So we thought we could begin by incorporating a whole series of these lower scale buildings, as I said, for retail, for community facilities, and most important, I'll also show for amenities for the current residents, including a greatly expanded amenity package and pool deck for them. Next. And then we also placed new towers. We placed them on the back side, on the base side. So we're not touching any of the existing three buildings. Very important, we're not removing a single apartment. We're positioning the new buildings back and away from them so they don't interfere with the views. So these are the new tower positions, which are currently set in the parking lot on the base side and one also on Beach 108th Street. Next. And then finally, we put this together where you can see the combination of the scales of the smaller, finely scaled buildings. I'm going to show you illustrations of these and the towers, as well as mixing it with mid-rise buildings and connecting it all together to really create one fabric and to start to bring back some of the original character and engage the streets. Next. And a key part of that is open space. So we're looking to plant hundreds of trees, create gardens, create green lawns, use native plantings that actually draw on the beautiful Rockaway Beach, uh, you know, feel and character that makes this a unique place. So we're creating dunes and dune plantings and seagrass. And, and we're going to incorporate all of these into a series of green spaces where today there is mostly asphalt. Next. And then finally, this shows how we put the whole thing together. The combination of buildings, open spaces, connections, new amenities for the existing residents, separate amenities for the new housing, greater housing choices. And I'll take you into some detailed drawings that show you how this actually looks. Next. So here's the overall plan. And we'll kind of put this in context. Next slide. And I'll go quickly so you have a chance also for your testimony. So this is the existing three buildings encircled in red. You can also see the existing pool deck, which is sort of in the backside on the parking lot for the residents. I'd like to create something much nicer for the existing residents. Next slide. And here is a proposed plan zoomed in where you can see the three original buildings untouched. You can see the new towers in the back, the open space in between. And we're going to take you into each component of this and show you what it would like look like existing and then proposed. Next slide. So here are some renderings that illustrate that. Next. So here is Beach 108th Street. So you can see here, we'd like to engage this with new retail leading to the public space in the beach. Next slide. So this is what it looks like today. You have the existing buildings, you have the street. Next slide. And this is what it would look like, where we're lining it with these smaller scaled buildings. We're looking at making them out of wood, sustainable forms of wood, creating active edges, retail, community facilities, taking what is really a fence today, parking it extensively, planting it extensively with plantings. And also, we're lifting up the whole site. I'll talk later about resiliency, where through this much wider sidewalk and retail that we would place along here, we can also actually elevate the whole site in order to protect it for future resiliency. Next slide. This will even show a little closer up. So here we are on Beach 108th Street looking towards the beach, if you will. And today there's just a barren fence there surrounding a parking lot. And we're replacing all those cars and putting them in an interior garage and adding many, many more. Next slide. So that that allows us to create this. This is a view from the exact same position, looking on Beach 108th Street, filling it with trees, plantings, elevating the site so that the ocean can never come in here, even with future climate change, and activating the edge with all small-scale retail that'll be year-round and serve the community, the whole community, not just this development. Next slide. So here we have the Rockaway Street views. This was that original street in that first diagram that used to go through before Robert Moses demolished all the streets in the neighborhood. Next slide. And so here today is a view looking past the buildings in the parking lot, and you can see the buildings there in the foreground. Next. And the same view afterwards would have these small scale buildings, including a whole amenity program and complex just for the existing residents of the three buildings that would be located on this and a pedestrian walkway connecting it together, planted with trees. Next. This shows the kind of smaller scale of the bungalows too. Here I focus on the resident pool amenity. Again, this is just for the residents of the three existing buildings. The new buildings would have their own separate amenities on their rooftop. So this would be just for the people who live there today. Next. This is today, what is that parking lot between two of the buildings? So this gives you a view of where we would locate it. And they have a, a tiny little pool that's sort of behind us in this right now. Next. 
And this is the proposed view. You can see we've created these contemporary sustainable bungalow structures. It would contain a gym, community room, party room, swimming pool. You know, we wanted to create something very special. Next slide. And some details showing how we elevate that. It's going to have views of the water. Next slide with gardens and plantings in between. They're all pulled away from the existing buildings. We think this could be special. I'll show you a view of the pool deck on the other side in a moment. Next. This is a view of the pool deck here. So you can see that's also elevated. And again, this is just for the existing residents of the three buildings. Next slide. Okay. So this is a view of the aquatic center. Uh, now this is a new building to be located on Shorefront Boulevard. So this is immediately between the two buildings. It's in front of the pool complex. And this would be for the whole community. It would have an extensive indoor pool. Next slide. And here's a view from the water showing the existing three buildings and the beachfront next. And then this shows actually with the new aquatic center, it's that building in the middle right. And so this is a community facility that would be constructed for the benefit of the whole community. And we found this is something through a lot of outreach with the community that many people were interested. You know, some parts of the community were interested in having this because they wanted to get lifeguard jobs for their children. They needed certification programs. Other people in the community were frankly concerned about their children for their safety because the beach can be dangerous. And many children, unfortunately, in New York City and from disadvantaged communities don't know how to swim. And so we think that the Aquatic Center really addresses a huge segment of the population and many people with very divergent points of views, actually in our outreach to them, suggested that this was one thing on which different people in the community could agree. And so we've decided to include that within the project. Next slide. And here's some details of that you can see. So this would be a wonderful public facility. It would have youth programs, senior programs, and serve the greater community. Next. This is the Serpentine Lawn. We'd love to create a beautiful open green area within the center of the project where today there is just asphalt. Next. And here is a view that shows what that looks like today. Next. And this is a view looking through the buildings with that great open space and green lawn that all the residents here would enjoy and really create a beautiful green open space. Next. We'll show you a view from the other direction too. This also shows some of the details. Again, those little bungalow structures, we could create places for youth programs, job creation programs, incubators. The client has already even uh, donated some space in their existing buildings to encourage these community groups. So we think this would be wonderful along this green open space facing the ocean. Next. And here's a view looking the other way. So between those buildings where today it's somewhat barren, there's a little bit of grass. Next. And this is what we would replace it with. So it would be one open, beautiful area. We're working with Ken Smith, who's a world famous landscape architect to create a whole series of dunescapes, cypress plantings, green plantings, beach grass to make something really special. Next. This is, we're near the end, Beach 105th Street, where we're looking on this side, on the other side, the north side of the project to show how we could create smaller scaled housing to also kind of mitigate the scale of the buildings. Next. And so we're creating these kind of townhouse structures. Here you can see the before slide, again, just sort of a fence and parking area. And the after view from the exact same view, the next slide please, shows these smaller scaled houses that are very much in keeping with the scale of the Rockaways. Again, they're elevated, they have green gardens, stoops, openings. We think this would be a beautiful way to mitigate the scale. Next, one of the most important features is a resiliency hub. I feel strongly and passionately about this. The Rockaways suffered terribly during the storm of Superstorm Sandy, as well as is really vulnerable to many other storms. You know, the people that were there as the water came in from both sides of the island, from the ocean and the bay side, remember how frightening that was. Next slide. So today in this area, which is on Beach 105th Street, you know, here you have just a fence and an area with parking for a couple of cars. Next, we are proposing as part of this project that we are elevating this entire site. This site is unique among the Rockaways. First, it's already one of the highest areas of the Rockaways, but we're looking to add significant additional elevation, multiple feet, way in advance of what's required actually by zoning. And as part of that, by elevating the whole site, we will protect the existing three buildings, all of the new buildings, but much more than that, We'd like to create a resiliency center that will actually benefit the greater community outside this development. We're looking at including elevated fire trucks like the one on the left, which was pioneered in Boston and proven very successful. We tie this into our parking garage where we can have emergency vehicles. The development of this scale allows for generators and potable water. 
this will be one of the safest, most resilient places in the community. And, and I reach out to the community as I define this to say that this is something we need. And over a decade after Sandy, when so little has been done to look towards the future of protecting the Rockaways, we believe this project can do something that's unheard of, create a resiliency hub, a public-private partnership that will actually benefit not just the new development, but the entire Rockaways community as they seek to recover from future storms. We believe passionately in this. Next slide. So this really is my presentation to you today. I'm going to introduce Joe, who's going to take you through the environmental aspects. And I thank you for listening to that. I look forward in the future public discussions uh, to respond to people's questions, not today, but as we go forward into the review process. Thank you. Joe, if you'd like to take over. Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph McKenzie from Philip Aviv and Associates, the firm that prepared the draft scope of work and will be preparing the draft environmental impact statement, or DEIS. I will provide an overview of the draft scope of work, which provides the framework for how the DEIS will be prepared. Next slide, please. The DEIS will be consistent with the guidance of the latest version of the City Environmental Quality Review Technical Manual, also referred to as the Secret Technical Manual. The Secret Technical Manual is a standard guidance document for environmental analysis and review in the City of New York. Seeker is a disclosure process by which decision makers Evaluate the potential environmental consequences before approving a discretionary action. Seeker compares the future no action condition to the future with action condition through a reasonable worst case development scenario. The DDIS will analyze the incremental changes that would reasonably be expected to occur if the proposed actions are adopted. Public comments will be incorporated into a final scope of work. Then a DEIS will be prepared in accordance with the final scope of work which will then be published for public review and comment as well. Once published, a public hearing will be held on the DEIS in which all comments received during the hearing will be incorporated into the final environmental impact statement or FEIS. Next slide, please. As detailed in the draft scope of work, a reasonable worst case development scenario was established for the 2032 analysis year. In the no action condition, it is anticipated that the on-site conditions would remain unchanged from existing conditions as they are today. In the with action condition, it is assumed that 15 new buildings, buildings A through D, E1 and E2, F1 through F3, G1 through G3, and R1 through R3, comprising the proposed development will be completed and fully occupied on the proposed development site within the project area. As was summarized earlier in this presentation, the proposed development will contain a combined total of approximately 1.3 million gross square feet of building space, comprising approximately 1,560 dwelling units, community facility space, commercial retail, accessory parking, as well as publicly accessible area space, also known as PAA. Pursuant to the city's MIH program, up to 25 to 30% of the proposed dwelling units would be designated as permanently affordable at an average of 60 to 80 percent of the area median, median income depending on the options selected during Euler. Next slide please. As shown in this table when comparing the no action condition to the with action condition under the proposed development the proposed actions are expected to result in the net addition of approximately 1,560 dwelling units including up to 468 units that would be designated as permanently affordable pursuant to MIH option two, which would be equivalent to 30% of the units, 30,522 gross square feet of community facility space, 36,190 gross square feet of commercial retail space, 1,181 parking spaces, and 2.15 acres of public access area space. In terms of population, the proposed development could generate up to approximately 4,212 incremental residents and 285 incremental, incremental workers within the project area as compared to the no action condition. With the reasonable worst case development scenarios established and using criteria outlined in the secret technical manual, the EEIS will determine if significant adverse impacts would occur. Next slide, please. As detailed in the draft scope of work and shown on this slide, the proposed actions require consideration of 15 
of the 19 impact categories outlined in the secret technical manual. The draft scope of work provides a detailed outline of how the 15 technical areas will be examined. And for each of the technical areas, it, it identifies study areas, types of data to be gathered, and how these data would be analyzed and the potential impacts quantified when appropriate. Per the guidance of the secret technical manual, the proposed actions would not warrant analysis for the historic and cultural resources, natural resources, solid waste and sanitation services, and energy technical areas. I will now briefly discuss a few of the technical areas to be analyzed in the DEIS. For example, as the proposed actions would introduce new residents to the area, an analysis of socioeconomic conditions, as well as public schools, libraries, and child care centers will be warranted. The residents introduced to the area by the proposed actions would also increase demand for use of publicly accessible open space, and therefore an analysis of open space resources is warranted. The proposed actions would also result in an increase in the number of vehicular trips and increased ridership on mass transit facilities, as well as affect pedestrian movements in the area due to the increased number of residents and workers. Therefore, a detailed transportation analysis will be included in the DEIS, which will analyze the changes to traffic, transit pedestrians, street user safety, and parking conditions as a result of the proposed actions. Due to the increase in the number of vehicle trips within the area, the DEIS will also study the pro project generated effects on ambient noise and air quality conditions as a result of mobile sources. In addition, both the noise and air quality analyses will study the effects of stationary sources. Construction of the proposed de development is expected to take place over a period of approximately six years and is therefore considered long-term pursuant to the secret technical manual. As such, the DEIS will evaluate the duration and severity of the disruption or inconvenience to nearby sensitive receptors as a consequence of the proposed development's construction. The construction analysis will provide a description of the proposed construction program and phasing and will examine the potential long-term construction impacts of the proposed development on transportation systems as well as air quality and noise conditions. Next slide, please. In addition, the DEIS will include a mitigation chapter, which describes mitigation measure, measures to address any significant adverse impacts that are identified in the DEIS. Where impacts cannot be mitigated, they will be identified as unavoidable adverse impacts. An alternative chapter will also be included in the DEIS to evaluate alternative development proposals that may reduce or eliminate any significant adverse impacts. The alternatives are usually defined when the full extent of a proposed action's impacts have been determined. As of now, the DEIS is expected to study a no action alternative, which assumes the project area would remain as is under existing conditions, and a no significant adverse impact alternative, which presents a scenario where all action generated impacts are either eliminated or avoided. Additional alternatives may be developed during the scoping process in coordination with the lead agency, DCP. A chapter summarizing all comments on the draft scope of work and DEIS will be included as well. The draft scope of work can be viewed in its entirety online on DCP's website as seen at the bottom of this slide. Thank you for your time. This marks the end of the applicant's presentation on the 106-10 Shorefront Parkway rezoning and LSGD project and overview of the secret framework. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Stephanie Shalou from DCP. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the applicant team for that presentation. Uh, we will now move on to part two of the meeting. And at this time, we will be receiving members of uh, elected officials, community board leaders, and government agency representatives. As a reminder, uh, when your name is called, you will be promoted to panelist, which will allow you to unmute your microphone and the ability to turn on your camera if you wish. There is a short period that it appears you're no longer in the meeting. Don't be alarmed. You'll automatically rejoin the meeting as a panelist. Uh, if anyone has technical issues that prevent you from sharing your testimony, we'll pause, try to troubleshoot in the background, uh, reach out and see if we can resolve any technical issues and come back to you. Um, please remember that you can visit the how-to guides on the NYC Engage webpage for assistance. Um, the information shown at the bottom of the screen is the best way uh, to receive assistance via phone. 
by dialing 877-853-5247 using the meeting ID 618-237-7396, and the password is 1. Uh, With that, we will uh, move to our speakers that are elected officials, government agencies, or those speaking on behalf of the community board. Um, I'll also note that we will move through all registered speakers in the order in which they've signed up. Um, Please note that if the only way that we're able to align our registered speakers with those of you in Zoom is if you use your same name that you registered with in Zoom. Uh, So some folks... uh, we will try to try to troubleshoot, but if you registered under a different name when you joined Zoom, uh, please rejoin the Zoom with the name that you registered with. Uh, we will now move to our speakers in this first category of elected officials, government agencies, and community board reps, the first of which is Assembly Mem- Member Stacey Pfeffer Amato. Um, Assembly Member, you we have uh, two attendees with your name. So if you can go ahead and hit the raise hand button in the Zoom feature so that we are able to promote you and hear your testimony. All right, thank you so much. We will promote you to panelists and hear your testimony. Good afternoon. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you for that um, very descriptive, because I did have a pause and I just panicked. So thank you for the instructions. I appreciate that. Um, And thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to read my uh, formal letter that's going. I think it says everything I feel. I'm writing to express my deep, first I'll say I'm Stacey Pefferamato, Assemblywoman from the 23rd Assembly District that represents the area we're talking about today, the Surfside. I'm writing to express my deep objection and firm opposition to the plan proposed by Alma Realty to build nearly 2,000 units on the Rockway Peninsula. As the New York State Assemblywoman who represents most of the Rockway Peninsula since taking office in 2017, I've worked in tandem with the tenants of the apartment complex to resolve hundreds of cases that are the result of a bad landlord. Alma Realty has ignored tenant concerns, violated numerous existing laws and regulations on this in the city and state level, and continuously in place on different worst landlords lists. Let me be clear, Alma is a bad landlord. In this instance, in our neighborhood, and we don't need any more of them. A horrible community partner and should never be allowed to build new housing units on the peninsula. I routinely met with Alma Realty on the property managers and only to have after intense pressure and continuous long meetings of some problems to fix, but temporarily band-aids, I'll say. The The Surfside Housing Tenant Association of Tenants, Shaft, who does amazing, amazing, amazing work, um, organizing and working with my office to hold Alma accountable. However, Alma does not take any initiative or look ever to help existing tenants. They cannot be allowed to build new units and further harm residents of our community when the disrespect to the tenants they are currently responsible for. The Rockway Peninsula has seen massive overdevelopment in the past few years, and we have not received the corresponding infrastructure we need to thrive from New York City government. This has, not, this has been noted by our local community boards, which passed a resolution to institute a moratorium upon zoning, up zoning in our community. Our community groups do not want this plan. The tenants do want this, want this and, I, and I, as a state official, respecting the community that I represent, do not want this. I urge the New York City planning, sorry, New York City Department of Planning to deny Alma Realty's request to build new units in the Rockway Peninsula. I ask that the city respect and defend the residents who live here and not allow for more and new forms of pain and suffering to be brought on our community. Um, I will be happy to provide any additional information. And just to add, I heard uh, one of the people say that they were developing a cohesive plan for the block. This is not a cohesive plan for the peninsula. The, the did not hear about what will come to the old buildings or the things that should be done so they are feeling good about themselves and what this looks like as a development. But to put 18 pounds of sausage in a one pound bag is not a fit for our community. It's not, uh, we are overdeveloped and still continuing to overdevelop. So I ask, I plea to the Department of City Planning to start looking at comprehensive and cohesive Peninsula as one unit and see what you're doing. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Obviously, I'm in Albany, uh, but I thank you for the opportunity to give my testimony today. 
Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day uh, to be here. And we look forward to, to your written testimony if you would also you. like to provide that. Thank you. Our next speaker is going to be Councilwoman Joanne Ariola, a council member. You will be promoted to panelist in just a moment. Um, our next speaker following the councilwoman will be Dolores Orr to be followed by Denise Lopresti, just to give a heads up for those next speakers. Hi, good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, thank you. And as I sat here watching that that um, PowerPoint presentation, I thought, wow, I'm watching the land of make-believe. It was offensive to the people who now reside at Surfside, to the people who represent that area, and to the people who live on that peninsula. Good afternoon, and for those of you who don't know me, I am Councilwoman Joanne Ariola, and I represent the area where Alma Realty is seeking to place their latest development. I am clearly, and I have been vocally, opposed to this plan in its entirety. You might ask why. Because time and time again, Alma Realty has demonstrated its utter dis disregard for the welfare of the community and the residents of the Surfside buildings, which are currently owned and managed by Alma. The residents regularly call my office to complain about problems ranging from insufficient heating to malfunctioning elevators to water supply issues, just to name a few. And they're only addressed when our office sends emails to Alma requesting either a site meeting we're telling them that they have to do this or we're going to report them. This is a very troubling trend. And it isn't confined to Rockaway. Last year, the city of New York filed legal action against Alma, alleging that the company has maintained dangerous and unsanitary conditions in 13 buildings under their supervision, where more than 800 violations remain uncorrected. You saw pictures before what they wanna do after, what is now, what will be. What you see when they show you the darkest time of day and the worst lighting and the worst angle to, to, to um, picture Surfside, what they're showing you is their neglect of those buildings. The city's lawsuit states that Alma's buildings contain conditions such as defective electrical wiring, missing fire doors, lead-based paint hazards, and infestations of mice and rats. We've seen those types of defective um, conditions at Surfside and had to have them corrected. It's completely unacceptable, and I want to make it very clear, Alma, is a slumlord. They are a slumlord and they should not be granted any additional projects anywhere in New York City and especially not in Rockaway. Rockaway, as many of you know, is a very unique place that is wholly unsuitable for the kind of development that Alma is planning. There is a severe lack of infrastructure, a lack of adequate schools, and a lack of access to proper medical care. A recent study also found that the construction of these new towers would significantly impact the water table level and the peninsula's subsurface hydrology and raise concerns about the efficiency of a coastal evacuation in the face of an emergency as it seeks to bring thousands of new residents to the area. This new influx of people would only add to the chaos and clutter when we are trying to evacuate a level one flood zone. And given the state of the local infrastructure, it could potentially lead to a catastrophe. These reasons all make it clear that this project should never go forward. We should be focused on improving the infrastructure of the peninsula rather than talking about allowing a slumlord to build another residential tower here or a behemoth of a project with really great renderings 
and perfect, perfect um, landscaping. It is an absolute lie. And if you believe it, I have a bridge to sell you. Due to the infrastructure, density, safety, and, and every issue that has been brought up, Alma has never proven themselves to have the ability to be responsible landlords. This is not new. This, this, whole pro, this whole development has been kicked around for a long time before I was elected. When I was first elected, we met with Alma. We identified what was wrong with the buildings and said, show me what you can do to tell me that, that show me that you can make living well for the existing tenants. And then maybe we can have a conversation. Well, the living arrangements have not gotten better, not without force, not without calling our office, not without calling their office constantly. I oppose this project and I will always oppose this project. Thank you for the time. Thank you. We certainly appreciate your time and uh, look forward to receiving your, your written testimony. Um, and as a reminder, all comments will be summarized and responded to in the final scope of work that will be uh, prepared for the project. Thank you again for your time. Um, all right. Uh, we're still in our uh, elected officials, government agencies, and community board representatives section. Our next speaker is Dolores Orr to be followed by Denise Lopresti. Dolores Orr, you are our next speaker. We will promote you to panelist. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dolores Oran. I'm chair of Community Board 14. So since Community Board 14 uh, will have will be going through the EULA process and making our formal recommendation after it's reviewed thoroughly by the full board, what I want to make everyone aware of and remind the city agencies that on June 1st of 2022, there was a resolution by Community Board 14. Uh, minus one vote, it was otherwise unanimous. And this resolution has been sent to Mayor Adams, has been sent to HPD, has been sent to city planning and to all of our elected officials. So for folks that don't know, we are advisory and we're often reminded of that. So our voice is supposed to be heard, but many times it's not. So on June 1st of 2022, uh, we took into consideration the entire peninsula because what happens on one end impacts the other. And in looking at what has happened to our uh, peninsula in the past six, seven years, we have over 12,000 units of new housing and mid and high rise buildings. And if they've not already been built, they'll be finished in the next two to three years. With that, we have we project to be at least 30,000 new residents. And Alma's project is not part of the statistics we had when we uh, passed this resolution. And why have we done that? Because we continue to have a shortage of adequate school seats. Alma said, said, said nothing about a school. Auburn by the Sea built, is building a school. And um, and so that was in their plan when they knew how many people they were bringing in. Alma gave no consideration to that. Um, there, We have not been approved uh, for any funding to plan for any additional schools from the city. The city has not implemented flood mitigation measures in all of our Bayside communities. And this, this particular area of the peninsula is the narrowest piece of land on the peninsula. And so they are feet from the ocean and two blocks from the bay. And no, nothing has done but been done by Army Corps or the city of New York for um, implementation of mitigation on the bay side. Uh, there's been requests for building bulkheads, seawalls, storm uh, drainage, and tidal gates, but nothing has happened. Uh, in addition to that, 
even after Sandy, and I'm going to say on a personal note, I get insulted when people who were not here during Sandy tell us what happened and how we felt. So that's just on a personal note. Um, so we have no evacuation route even at this time. More than 10 years later, the city has yet to come plan for an evacuation. And how are we going to do that with another that three, 4,000 people? Um, the other thing is hospital. We have a very small hospital, which is overwhelmed with the increase of population, with the existing population. Uh, and unless there's a trauma center or another hospital in this picture, again, this is why we have made the resolution I'm going to read to you in a moment. In addition to that, uh, we asked for a district-wide environmental impact study. By the city doing it in little pieces and not looking at this barrier island, which technically it is because there was a landfill in a section that combined us, Without them doing district-wide, and why won't they do district-wide? Because it would show that not another person should move to this island of ours. Um, so we they've never agreed to where they look at transportation, traffic flow, street widening, parking, school seats, economic development. That includes real permanent jobs. All these, everyone take training and, okay, we're going to let you work for six months here and six months there. There's been no effort with our isolation for full permanent uh, job creation. Um, and again, the evacuation plan, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, they have, there is fund and they're completing the installation of their flood mitigation on the ocean, but the year is the the Jamaica Bay side is not even the design has not even begun. So it's probably I don't know that I'll even be alive by the time that's done. Uh, so with all of that said, our resolution on June 1st, 2022 is that the Community Board 14 insist on a moratorium on all upzoning requests anything above, from a zone six to a zone 10 until such time that the requested environmental peninsula-wide impact study with the item in, items that I just stated, listed, have been planned and there is a peninsula-wide plan. And so that is, uh, and we have not approved an upzoning probably in three or four years. And we put everyone on notice two years ago. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your continued engagement on, on planning issues. Um, if you would like to also share your written testimony, we would appreciate that as well. Yeah, I'll send the, um, the, the motion again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next speaker in this group is Denise Lopresti, also speaking on behalf of the community board. Uh, Denise Lopresti, we will be promoting you to panelists in just a moment, and you will be invited to provide your testimony. Hello, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, for whatever reason, my video is not working at this moment. Hold on, I think I have. Okay, there we go. Whoops. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you for the presentations. Um, my name is Denise Lopresti. I am a Community Board 14 member and the committee chair for housing and land use. Community Board 14 adopted a moratorium at the end of our 2022 session to prevent upzoning of properties to control density and to focus on the need for critical infrastructure that does not exist and must be incorporated into the peninsula plans 
before any additional development is permitted. The residents of Surfside have presented to community board many times the issues they have experienced under Alma's management. They have been on the worst landlord list and are currently involved in lawsuits brought against them by the mayor's office for this mismanagement of other buildings in New York. The development, this level of development will strain the already limited infrastructure for emergency services, transportation, schooling, medical care, and evacuation off of the peninsula. The development will also require the use of all surrounding sidewalks and roadways, which will introduce more traffic congestion on the already small streets, noise, burden on schools and healthcare, as Rockaway has only one hospital. In the summer season, the Rockaway population and traffic already surges, which causes many other issues. Community Board 14 is opposed to upzoning as evidenced by the moratorium the board has adopted and we are very concerned about the level of development that is being asked within this project. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and thank you for uh, providing this to us. Thank you, thanks for being here and for your time today. All right, I'm checking our registered speakers. Uh, that does bring us to the close of the members of our part two of this meeting, elected officials, government agencies, and representatives of the community board. So at this time, we will move on to part three of the meeting, uh, where members of the general public are invited to speak for up to three minutes. A uh, time tracker will uh, display on our screen if we can go to the next screen. Um, again, same same uh, situation applies. Your name will be called when you are the next speaker. You will be promoted to panelist, which again takes a moment. You leave the Zoom meeting for just a moment and you automatically rejoin the meeting as a panelist. You will be invited to unmute your microphone and you are able to turn on your camera if you wish. Uh, after the three minutes have expired, you will be asked to conclude your remarks. Um, and again, if anyone experiences technical issues um, that you're not able to turn on your microphone or are not able to join a, as a panelist, uh, we will try to troubleshoot, move on, and come back to you at a later point once our technical issues have been resolved. Um, and again, you can join um, our dial-in participant hotline at 877-853-5247 with the meeting ID 618-237-7396 with a password of one. If you have any difficulties today, uh, that will help. we will help you troubleshoot in the background. All right, we will move on to our speakers. Um, our first speaker in this group is Mitch Glenn to be followed by Barbara Buffalino to be followed by Christopher Calabrese. Mitch Glenn, you're our first speaker. We'll promote you to panelist in just a moment. Hi there. Hi, welcome. Uh, just one second. Hmm. Be right with you. I am just trying to get there. Exit full screen. Okay. Um, so. My name is Mitchell Glenn, and I am a resident of Beach 109th Street, a block away from the proposed Surfside development. There are two points I want to make on why this proposed development cannot be allowed to proceed. One, Alma, as we've heard already several times, is a long-term deadbeat landlord. They've proven that they do not deserve to be part of this project. A city lawsuit filed earlier this year alleges that Alma has maintain dangerous and unsanitary conditions in 13 buildings throughout the city where more than 800 violations remain uncorrected. Some of the worst conditions in these buildings include deteriorating facades, defective electrical wiring, 
missing fire doors, lead-based paint hazards, and infestations of rats and mice. HPD also previously sued Alma over two of these buildings. The question then must be asked, if they can't maintain their current buildings, how can we entrust them to build and manage new ones? The second point I wanna make is that Rockaway infrastructure cannot handle the influx of the proposed 4,212 additional residents. Four, four items, schools, where will the added children go to school? Two, roads, Shorefront Parkway, Rockaway Beach Boulevard, Beach Channel Drive, and the Rockaway Freeway are all single lane roads and will be able, unable to handle the additional traffic, especially during an evacuation when lives are in danger. Three, parking. The pictures in the presentation were oh so pretty, but there were no renderings of where the ugly parking structures for almost 2,000 cars will be placed. So I think we deserve to see the renderings with the parking structures. And finally, emergency services, including hospitals. Only one overwhelmed hospital, St. John's, exists on the peninsula. Where will the additional needed medical services be provided? To quote a, a Surfside resident, Rockaway needs a hospital, more schools. We don't even have a movie theater. The last thing our overpopulated peninsula needs is more residents. Evacuation would be impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your thoughtful testimony and bringing these issues up. Um, we will move to our next speaker, Barbara Buffalino, to be followed by Christopher Calabrese, followed by Elsie Mao. Barbara, you will be promoted to a panelist in just a moment. And feel free to correct pronunciation if I'm getting that wrong, anyone's names. And as a reminder, all comments that we hear today and receive in writing will be summarized and responded to in the final scope of work uh, that will be all of these comments taken into consideration. Um, are we able to promote our next speaker, Barbara Buffalino? All right, it seems like we're having trouble promoting our next speaker. So we will reach out to you, uh, Barbara, in the background and move on to our next speaker, Christopher Calabrese. Christopher, you are our next speaker. We will promote you to panelist in just a moment to be followed by Elsie Mao. Good afternoon. Hi, welcome. Great. Uh, my name is Chris Calabrese, and I'm a resident of Rockaway Park on Beach 100th Street, just a few short blocks from the proposed development. I would like to go on record to say that this project is so outrageously irresponsible that it should have been dead on arrival. The entire Rockaway Peninsula is vulnerable, not in theory, but in actual practice to storms and extreme weather. And not just storms like Sandy, which is well documented, but lesser storms that happen a few times annually and which are increasing in frequency and strength as a result of climate change and rising sea levels. The fact that we would even think of adding thousands of dwellings, thousands of cars, and up to 8,000 new residents in the narrowest and most vulnerable area of Rockaway is unconscionable. After all the resources, it is still costing the city and the federal government in an ongoing rebuild to this community. To add more buildings, infrastructure, and humans into this high-risk area seems like a recipe for disaster. We continuously hear from our elected officials, community boards, engineers, and scientists that it is not if there is another catastrophic storm, but when. Furthermore, this developer, Alma, has a horrible reputation and are currently being sued by the city of New York for their underwhelming care and maintenance of their buildings across the city. And we would let them build in arguably the most vulnerable of locations. Speaking of, with many of our neighbors and community, I can't find anyone who believes this development is remotely responsible and we will be ready to mobilize it against it no matter what it takes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking time out of your day being here and voicing your, your concerns. 
We will move on to our next speaker, Elsie Mayo, to be followed by Karen Nevers, to be followed by Karen Whalen. Elsie, you are our next speaker. We'll promote you to panelist in just a moment. Uh, those of you with your hands raised, you are in our speaker's queue. We will we'll get to you in the order that folks have registered. So please lower your hands. We, will, we are moving through our speakers. Stephanie, can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Okay, no, this is Barbara. I just want to, I'm back on and now I have, I, I'll wait, I'll mute myself again. Okay, Barbara, you you are before the speaker, so we will we will hear your testimony now, Barbara. Okay, great. Okay, super. Yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon. My name is Barbara Buffalino, and I'm the leader of the Tennis Association called Shaft that represents the interest of the 2,000 residents that currently live at Surfside. I am also a community activist that is involved with the coalition of local civic associations that oppose this development. And I'm here today to say we are outraged to what this ALMA proposal contains and then the burden it introduces to the residents of Surfside and the Rockaway community. We got to remember that this is not an empty lot that we're talking about to develop. This project is trying to change the current zoning laws that are in place to protect the current residents and the environment. These changes will allow over a 300% increase in population density, allow structures that are double the size of the current buildings and re reduce the required spacing between buildings. This, is, this plan is very irresponsible and will endanger the current residents, the existing healthcare businesses that work on the property, the Jassa Center and the Rockaway community. There will also be environmental changes to our current land use that surround the building. We'll be losing our parking spots. And yes, our open and green recreational space, it will change the sunlight and airflow to the existing apartments and the adjacent properties around Surfside. And yes, you've already heard, Surfside is in the middle of a very high volume vehicle and pedestrian cross section. The Surfside property is vulnerable and is in a flood zone one with water tables rising. It is located on the narrowest part of the peninsula, which is three blocks between the Jamaica Bay and Atlantic Ocean. The initial environmental assessment identifies that this project will have significant adverse impact for the residents of Surfside and the community and does require a full environmental impact study. The ALMA project will be on the tail end of the 11 other development projects already approved for the peninsula in the Community Board 14 district. The Rockaway residents are already experiencing restriction and limitations as we move about day to day. The Rockaway Peninsula cannot endure any more development. We will be submitting a detailed written response to address changes and the other areas that need to be included in the environmental impact study before the April 15th deadline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony uh, and raising these issues. Um, and we look forward to the, the written comments. Uh, Elsie, thank you for your patience. You are our next speaker. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Elsie Mayo, M-A-I-O, and I am offering my statement from two perspectives, which are relevant to my comments here, I believe. Um, one is as a five-year resident of the Surfside Housing Complex, which is the site of the proposed development. And second, as an international expert in the field of ethical, sustainable business and business practice. In the second capacity, I maintain a semi-retired practice and I continue to sit for the past 15 years on the steering committee of a public interest organization Ethical Markets Media, LLC, and to provide expert commentary in national media and conferences from time to time on the topic of ethical business, ethical marketing, and sustainability. My concern about this draft scope of work is about risks to the city of New York that are inherent in this particular proposal risks that may not be apparent. Some are inherent to the site, which we will submit in a separate document in detail. But for now, I will mention one particular category of risk 
to the city of New York directly of engaging in any development project with the principles associated with Alma Realty. First, the risks of engaging with an entity whose consistent operating model includes chronic neglect of physical plant. And the implications for city infrastructure of engaging that model on a development project, I will let the city assess itself. Second, risks to the millions of New Yorkers who live in and visit the Rockaways from the five boroughs in the high season. The, we're people who don't have a place in the Hamptons. You know, we are the people that affordable housing is built for. We are the people for whom public beaches are built for. And the risks to all of those people of engaging with an entity who has a pattern of being unresponsive to the most vulnerable stakeholders in its scope, which we've heard a little bit about and will be documented subsequently. Third, I have 22 seconds left, okay. The hard taxpayer dollars and lost opportunity costs of our elected officials having to babysit a conglomerate because it doesn't make necessary and essential repairs. And I'm talking about the representatives that actually participated earlier. Is it a good use of New York City taxpayer dollars to have um, elected officials trying to enforce essential safety and um, health maintenance of our buildings? And I'll close thank here. You. Your time um, is up. We'll okay, look forward you to your much. to your written comments and any supporting uh, documents that you're you're with, able to that. provide. Thank you. thank you very much. Thanks for your testimony and for being here. Uh, our next speaker is Karen Nevers, to be followed by Karen Whalen, to be followed by Teresa McManus. Karen Nevers, you are our next speaker. Just as we're waiting to promote our next speaker, as a reminder, um, if you have not registered, please visit NYC Engage at nyc.gov slash engage to register to speak for this meeting. Hello, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Karen Nevers. I'm a resident living at Surfside for 40 years, and I also advocate for over 2,000 residents at the Surfside Housing Association. Alma bought this property 20 years ago due to bankruptcy. And over the years, public record shows that Alma has mortgaged against these buildings at Surfside. We, the residents living at Surfside, have first account. Alma are bad actors. Our home at Surfside is affordable housing. It's a complex with diversity demographics of retirees, civil service workers, the elderly, and young families. Our home has been managed by Alma for 20 years. During that time, the Tenant Association had to hold them accountable to address 13 health safety hazards well documented. Our Tenant Association has called upon our elected officials at state and city level in all these years to pressure them to do repairs. When Alma bought the buildings, they broke the Union 32 BJ. They decreased the staff and put a heavy workload on fewer people. They turned their back on fair wages and benefits. Yet the staff continue to do their best hard work every day. Alma's top-down management and performance has placed financial restriction on employees to do work efficiently and in turn has created a haphazard approach to maintaining essential services. Chronic interruption, heat, hot water, elevator safety, lack of clean air due to improper ventilation demonstrated by mold. The Tenant Association provided a document asking Alma to meet city regulation and standards, sanitation, cleaning, and recycling. They don't do that. They blunt, I bluntly state the following. The Alma Corporation for 20 years has demonstrated systematic neglect, deferring essential repairs on a routine schedule. Residents have paid with their health to live in affordable housing under a bad actor. Now Alma is using their money not to invest in taking care of the current buildings in their residence, but to gentrify Rockaway as a resource and continue to build their empire. 
This proposal has the means to displace and destabilize current residents and the current uh, community under irresponsible development. It will destroy our Rockaway community. It will be our demise. Development greed is causing harm to the peninsula. Their PR approach, reimagine Rockaway. Alma should have started planting plants and acting as good people 20 years ago when they took over this property. They are not good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for providing your testimony. We will move to our next speakers. And I'll just note for attendees, when we call your name, there's no need to uh, click the raise hand button. We have you ordered in Zoom. Uh, so please do not raise your hand when we call your name. We will. It's easiest for us if you just stay put and we're able to promote you to panelist. Um, all right, moving ahead, our next speaker is Karen Whalen to be followed by Teresa McManus, followed by Robin Gonzalez. Uh, Karen Whalen, you are our next speaker and we will promote you to panelist. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Karen Whalen, and I'm a resident of 10620. And I feel that, first of all, this m meeting is inappropriate being on a Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so not available for any other residents to join in. This um, Alma can't even take care of their own property as is, and they want to add more. We have problems with bugs. We have problems with water. As of today, the water was shut off because they needed to do problems with it. Elevators. Um, they can't maintain the parking lots when it snows. They can't maintain the garbage that's blowing all around the buildings. And they don't care about the residents here. They're only caring about the money. And it is absolutely ludicrous. We don't have hospitals. We don't have schools. We don't even have parking in general now. And they want to add all of this development. So I feel that this is really a disgusting dis uh, um, proposal for the residents of Rockaway. And I really hope this does not take place. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking time out of your day. And of course, we encourage folks to uh, submit written testimony if, if, they are, if they are inclined to do so. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Teresa McManus, followed by Robin Gonzalez, followed by Sarah Kenny. Uh, Teresa McManus does not appear to be in the Zoom. Uh, Teresa McManus, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, please go ahead and join the Zoom that would have been emailed to you upon registration. Uh, we will come back to you if you join, but for now we will move on to our next speaker, Robin Gonzalez. We'll promote you to panelists to be followed by Sarah Kenny, followed by Paul King. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay, sorry. My name is Robin Gonzalez. I'm a longtime resident of uh, Rockaway Beach. I want to first state that even after Sandy, we were given funds to build an additional school and a hospital, which has not taken place. The infrastructure is greatly demised. On the section of 108th Street in the middle, uh, where the Rockaway Hotel is and the section of where Rite Aid is, that ground there has... Um, has opened up and a big sinkhole has been there at least two times. Additionally, because of all the unnecessary building, all the streets are now flooding because they're not pitching the roads correctly, not putting the piping in correctly. And now the streets flood from one end to the other. Um, as stated, they should have never built an apartment building on the grounds where uh, Peninsula Hospital used to be. There's an already existing nursing home. They should have all right uh, revamped that hospital and built one because um, they had plenty of land to build additional co-ops co and apartment buildings. Um, on that 108th Street is more and more flooding all the way, all the way to the bridges where they've been shut down because of that we are not a, we are a landfill. 
And so more building is just going to further jeopardize the peninsula. And the whole evacuation uh, process, that whole roadway from beginning to end floods from land to land. Two of our area representatives had to relocate their offices because of the prominent flooding from one door to the other. And people are getting stuck in their houses towards the bayside. So they really need to address the the uh, how they're doing things and stop this massive building. I agree with everybody that what was saying here. We don't have any services. All of our services have been taken away. Um, we don't have enough people for the mental health. Uh, I love the autism community because they're rebuilding back the services that were taken away from us. We don't need any more housing. We do need another hospital. And we need our infrastructure to be rebuilt. The whole bay wall, there's parts of it that are collapsing in. So I would like to see all that addressed before any other building is taking place. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony and for being here today. We appreciate your testimony. Um, our next speaker is Sarah Kenny, to be followed by Paul King, to be followed by Amanda Agolila. Uh, Sarah Kenny, you are our next speaker. Great. Um, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. That pause is terrifying. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. As you said, my name is Sarah Kenny. I'm a Rockaway community member and resident. I also am lucky enough to own one of the bungalows on Beach 108th Street that have been talked about earlier in the presentations. As a matter of fact, the architect used a photo that literally is my bungalow. Um, so I'm familiar with the area. So today I come as uh, neighbors to the proposed development site, and I wanted to voice my opposition and concern over this project by highlighting two specific elements that are in the draft scope of work. As you know, the DCP in the scope of work has noted that the proposed actions are going to potentially have significant adverse environmental impact. I'd like to cite page three of the report, which has a statement that says that three of the four surrounding streets that surround the projects are, quote, wide streets. Now, this term is not defined, but I can tell you that anyone who has ever driven on those streets, specifically Beach 108th and then Shorefront Parkway, know that this is not factually correct. Beach 108, which borders the bungalows, uh, is a single lane in each direction that's that's uh, centered on a fixed median, and there's parking on both sides. It is already congested with deliveries to local businesses, double parkers, beach drop-offs, and the like, as it is. I can attest to you from 50 years of experience that when the two to 300 summer residents of the bungalows come every year, it has a significant impact on the parking and the infrastructure and the sanitation. So I can only imagine with horror what 10 times that number would mean. The second thing I'd like to note is the waivers that the, um, that the proposer is requesting within the scope of work. The maximum base height of a structure, a residential structure outside Manhattan is 65 feet and the maximum building height is 55 feet. The proposer is asking for waivers of three to five times that amount, maximum base height of 220 feet and maximum building height of 280 feet when the baseline of allowed uh, maximum height is 55 feet. These limits were put in place for a reason. That Rockaway is basically a barrier island that is in no, no that is no doubt sinking, and quite simply, this project will have a disastrous environmental and public safety impact that is laid out in the company's own scope of work. So I urge you to reject this proposal in any manner that you can. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here and and for providing your testimony. All right, we will move on to our next set of speakers, Paul King, Amanda Agolia, and Thomas Sullivan. Paul King, you are our next speaker. I'm getting there. Hello, welcome. 
Welcome. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, I'll put my camera on too. My name is Paul King. I'm president of the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association, and I'm here today to express our strong opposition to this egregious rezoning proposal. You cannot pick a worse spot for the major development that Alba proposes. This is a low-lying barrier beach with less than 2,000 feet between the beach itself and, and Jamaica Bay. After Hurricane Sandy, we do not have an actionable evacuation plan. Putting this development here is simply dangerous. Even if the Resiliency Center protects Alma's new customers, it makes the rest of us less safe. Beyond the danger, this project will have a dramatically negative effect on the quality of life. Our schools are already overcrowded. Where are we gonna put another 5,000, sorry, 500 to 1,000 students? Our access to healthcare is limited. As we saw in the tragedy of police officer Diller, we have no trauma center on Rockaway, and it already takes a very long time to get to our one hospital, St. John's. If you put this big development there, people in my neighborhood in an emergency are going to have to look to someplace in Brooklyn uh, to try to get help, and that's just not acceptable. We already have stormwater and sewage issues every month, whether it's from the tides or from the rain. So a large development will exacerbate these problems. And finally, I mean, traffic's gotten worse, I guess, everywhere in recent years, but it's been very bad in Rockaway. Now, Alma wants to put four towers at a point where Shorefront Parkway ends, where Rockaway Beach Boulevard narrows, where the Rockaway Freeway ends. That's just crazy. That will impact public transportation and private transportation in a terrible way. So again, you cannot pick a worse spot for this development. Uh, it must not be allowed to proceed. And the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association ask you to take all this into account with the environmental impact study and stop this project cold. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here and for your testimony. Um, thank you to everyone who is, who is raising issues of the environmental review here today. Um, our next speaker is Amanda Agolia, to be followed by Thomas Sullivan, followed by Nancy Schwears. Hi, my name is Amanda Agolia, and I am the president of the Neponset Property Owners Association. We are at the western end of the peninsula, and we are sure to feel the saturation of extra residents here in the Rockways. Uh, we don't have proper infrastructure. We don't have enough emergency hospitalization, schools, adequate evacuation route. We, we are opposed to the up zoning. We are opposed to any new buildings. We know that Alma has not been a very good landlord. And we are a small coastal area which cannot support any more uh, building units, dwelling units. We just, it's just not a good idea for our community. So we as the Neponset property owners feel that this should not take place. We are completely opposed to this project and we'd like to share our support with the residents of the already existing buildings. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks for being here today and for sharing your testimony. Um, our next speaker is Thomas Sullivan to be followed by Nancy Schwears to be followed by Andrew, Andrew Lauro. Uh, Thomas Sullivan, you're our next speaker. All right. Uh, Thomas Sullivan does not appear to be in the meeting. I'm just checking with my back of house team. Um, Thomas, if you are 
joining on. If you are viewing the YouTube, uh, please feel free to join via the link uh, that was that was emailed to you, and we will uh, add you to the speaker's queue if you are able to join. Um, our next speaker is Nancy Schwears, to be followed by Andrew Lauro, followed by Jack May. Nancy Schwears, you will be promoted in just a moment, and we will hear your testimony. All right, checking with back of house um, if we're having technical issues promoting Nancy to a panelist. All right, Nancy, if you're having any technical difficulties, please reach out to our dial-in participant hotline that was shown at the beginning of this, the screen. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Lauro to be followed by Jack May, followed by Thomas Toomey. Um, Andrew Lauro does not appear to be in the meeting, and nor does Jack May, nor Thomas Toomey. Um, if any of you are uh, join, if you are viewing on YouTube, um, if you hear your name, please hop over to the Zoom so that we can hear you speak at this meeting. Um, otherwise, we will continue with our um, registered speakers who are are. In the meeting, we'll just make a note of who we are skipping. Um, following Thomas Toomey, um, the next speaker following Thomas Toomey is Harold Prigg. We don't see that speaker in the room. Um, so the next speaker is Janet Redmond, who does appear to be in the Zoom. Uh, Janet, we will promote you to panelist and invite you to share your testimony in just a moment. All right, if we can promote Janet Redmond, who is our next speaker that is here in our Zoom room. All right, uh, Janet Redmond, it also appears that we're having uh, technical difficulties promoting. If you uh, do not wish to speak, we will uh, hop, go to our next speaker. Um, if you do wish to speak, uh, we will we will show our, our dial-in participant hotline in just a moment if folks are having technical issues. Um, our next speaker after Janet Redmond is John Signorelli. John Signorelli does not appear to be in the room either. Um, our next speaker is Maureen Del Vecchio. Maureen does appear to be in the meeting, so if we can go ahead and promote Maureen to panelists uh, to share their testimony. Okay, I'm here. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Glad one of us got through anyway. <clears throat> I I was a, uh, a long time uh, tenant at Surfside, both before the Alma people took over and uh, unfortunately after. What a difference. Boy, you went from, uh, they weren't fiscally, the first owners weren't the fiscally smartest people, perhaps, but they were good to their tenants. They knew they had good tenants. They took care of their buildings. They took care of their workers. And they created a real 
hometown, lovely atmosphere for us all to live in. Uh, aside from the tenants and the workers still being good people, nothing is the same. Alma is a horrible landlord, horrible. They don't listen or respect their hardworking tenants, most of who are really good people and pay on time and are just a really bunch of good people. Um, if there's been a change in that, it's due directly to Alma and the people that they are bringing into the buildings, number one. every I have every belief in what everyone before me said about our infrastructure and all the rest of the reasons. This makes absolutely no sense. But one of my concerns is what are the safeguards that are going to be put in place for current tenants? Okay, they're going to be building 15 buildings, 15 buildings over the course of eight years. Okay, there's not going to be foundation cracks. We have foundation cracks from Sandy that haven't been prepared, properly corrected. So what is going to be put in place for the current tenants there for losing their air, their light, their views, their sunlight, their play spaces, their parking spots, which they say everyone with tenants is going to have a parking spot. How much more will they have to pay for the spots after this construction? What will that be charged? Where will their cars be moved to? And you say there's going to be plenty of parking. Now, I don't have all the numbers with me. I saw there's 1,181 new spots with 2,000 apartments coming in. Doesn't seem plausible. Doesn't seem plausible to me. If anyone had come comes to Rockaway from April to October and try to go down any one of those streets, you will understand what we are all so up in arms over as far as parking goes. It makes no sense on the postage stamp size of land that they have to put up all this additional building at the benefit to no one but themselves. There is nothing in this for the community. You wanna say an aquatic center, we have things around here. They have been calling tenants, trying to almost browbeat them into pleading their case on the positive. No one speaks positive for them. Hi. At the last community board meeting, one person spoke positive for them and that was their rep. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you for being here and Thank providing you your so testimony. much. Sorry, I'm a little passionate. No, we appreciate the we appreciate passion. Uh, and, and thank you. If you do would like to provide any written comments, of course, we would be happy to accept if you uh, didn't have a chance to make all of your points in, in the three minutes. Okay, um, thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, we do have Thomas Sullivan, who we skipped over back in the Zoom room. So we will try to uh, promote him to a panelist. Uh, so Thomas, you will be our next speaker. I will promote you and see if we're able to uh, hear your testimony at this time. Uh, if any of our skipped speakers have uh, joined or would like to join, uh, Andrew Lauro, Jack May, Thomas Toomey, Harold Prigg, uh, John Signorelli, uh, any of you, please, please join the Zoom at this time if you're able. Uh, do we have Thomas Sullivan? This is Tom Sullivan. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. My name is Thomas Sullivan. I am a fourth generation Rockaway resident, raising a fifth generation here on the peninsula. I'm here today to oppose the proposed plans of Alma Realty as presently submitted. The expansion of the footprints, specifically the increase in population, will only exacerbate an already challenged infrastructure, stress current amenities, and place an additional strain on emergency services. For decades, Alma has a history of neglecting their buildings and ignoring the concerns of the tenants of Surfside. You can see daily on Facebook the many complaints about the elevators, lack of hot water, leaking windows, and heat supply. Alma Realty refuses to do any more than absolute minimum to address the issues that are brought to their attention. And it seems even that it is too much to ask for them without the constant nudging of the local councilwoman's office. Besides the neglect, 
the enlarging of the footprint and adding these projects will neg negatively impact the quality of life of the current residents of the Rockaways. We do not have enough capacity in our schools, public health care facilities, especially trauma centers, to accommodate an increase in population to this scale. It will further stress and already burden the system. Our roads have narrowed, our sewer systems are insufficient, and our emergency services are already at capacity. In addition, the time it takes to get from one end of the peninsula to the other has increased by over 55% over the last couple of years. Adding more people to our evacuation route could be proved disastrous. Rockaway is in fact in need of infrastructure projects for our current residents. This development does not adequately address our needs, but exacerbates them. I oppose this project as submitted. Respectfully, Thomas Sullivan. Thank you. Thanks for joining for your testimony. We're glad you're able to uh, join the Zoom. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Marnie Ryan, followed by uh, Terry McManus, who I, I believe we had skipped before, uh, Denise Nezolowski, and Jiho George. Marnie Ryan, you are our next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Marnie Ryan, and I am a lifelong Rockaway resident. I am a shareholder at Dayton Towers, which is the property is directly adjacent to uh, Surfside. And I am uh, testifying today that I am adamantly opposed to this uh, proposal for rezoning. Um, I, I, I echo uh, everyone's previous uh, sentiments describing um, the negative impact that this will have on the community. And I would like to enter into the testimony, uh, into the record, a letter to the editor written by Thomas Kerr on behalf of the board of directors of Dayton Towers published in the Wave newspaper on January 27, 2023. I will probably run out of time, but I will submit this in writing so that the full letter is on the record. Dear editor, Dayton Towers Board of Directors is writing to express strong opposition to the development currently proposed by Alma Realty on its Surfside property found between Beach 105 to Beach 108 streets and from Shorefront Parkway to Rockaway Beach Boulevard. The proposed development intends to construct 20 story buildings and more than 2000 additional housing units added to their existing buildings. For perspective, Dayton Towers, already listed as one of New York City's largest Michelama co-ops, has 1,752 units over two properties with almost twice the physical footprint of Alma's proposed development. Shoehorning that much housing into such a small footprint portends social and urban planning problems that would harm the community. Though Alma proposes parking, it will not cover the marked increase in vehicular traffic in the area, which will lead to traffic congestion and parking problems for every Rockawayan. Further, a building this size will draw tremendously on the community infrastructure and undermine safe evacuation from the peninsula due to population density increases. Everything from street drainage to the electrical grid will be stressed. Further, Alma's record as a good corporate citizen and landlord is wanting. As recently as January 6, 2023, New York Law School reports Mayor Adams, along with the Corporation Council, filed two lawsuits against them for hundreds of violations, including defective wiring, missing fire doors, lead paint, rodents, and deteriorating facades. Alma has previously been sued by the Department of Housing and Preservation Development twice. That's quoted from Veronica Rose, City Law Fellow, NYLS grad, Cityland. The letter goes on, this record of neglect is matched with an undeniable exercise in corporate profit grabbing over responsible urban planning. It is far more likely that Surfside will mirror Florida's collapsed Champlain Towers than resemble the utopian presentation Alma promotes this project with. It is no small irony that profit inspired disaster Hi. in Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your testimony, for taking the time out of your day, and we look forward to your written submission as well.
Thank you. Um, I do see a, a attendee that we had skipped. Andrew Lauro has joined the meeting. Um, so we will go ahead and promote that speaker to panelists if we are able to hear their testimony. Andrew Lauro, we will promote you in just a moment. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Andrew Lauro. Uh, I subside at uh, One Beach, 105th Street, which is one of Alma's locations, uh, the three buildings. Uh, I've been in this building for 50 years, okay? Been through a number of landlords. Alma, without a doubt, is the worst. I've participated in more crews with Barbara and our, our uh, tenant committee, okay, along with their management people. Uh, it's like talking to the deaf, all right? Um, then not responsive. Uh, and I'm talking about their management people. The on-site people seem to do whatever they can do with limited uh, dollars, uh, okay? Because Alma does everything cheap. Our elevators are the worst, okay? And the guys that maintain that elevator, believe it or not, he, he works out of the back, the trunk of his car. This is three massive buildings with four elevators in each building, 12 elevators. And they got a guy working out the trunk of his car to repair these elevators. Uh, there's always problems with the heat in these buildings. There's always something going on with the water. There's no preventive maintenance on the buildings at all. It's all Band-Aid, okay? If there's a problem, oh, we're gonna shut down your water for a day. And for good reason, but that's not the way to operate buildings. My background is building management, okay? I was a building manager in New York City for over 25 years. I had over 5 million square feet, okay? And the tenant was always my focus. That's not the case here. The focus here is dollars, is money. That's all this man cares about is money, okay? And he's going about, uh, let me back up a little. On the renderings, renderings are always very pretty, okay? They don't show you what happens at the, at the very end. It's, it's never the same as the renderings, believe me. I've been through this numerous times, okay? The, 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 con the whole concept of Beach 108, you've heard it already, what Beach 108 is like. You can just about get a fire truck down that block on a normal day. It's, it's ridiculous, okay? This whole thing is ridiculous, okay? We need infrastructure. That's what we need. No more tenants. No more residential. We're done with residential and knockaway. It's just over the top. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here and providing your testimony. All right. Our uh, prior speaker in order was Marnie Ryan. So Terry McManus is our next registered speaker, followed by N Denise Nez Nezolowski. Um, neither of these speakers are present. So if you are watching via Zoom, uh, please do, uh, watching via YouTube, Apologies. Uh, please join the Zoom now so that we can hear your testimony. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jiho George, who was previously in the Zoom, but I am not seeing them present now. Um, so our next speaker is Margaret Powers. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so the people in the neighborhood are clearly opposed to Alma's development. Uh, the council member, Ariola, she is opposed to this development. Assembly member, Fefer Amato, is opposed to the development. Bell Harbor Property Owners Association, Neponset Property Owners Association, Community Board 14, they are all opposed to this development by Alma. 
our government of, by, and for the people should be representing the people of these neighborhoods. The people who live here and are on the ground, we see and we understand how the current, current level of development is not enough for our way of life and is unmanageable. As was stated earlier, this is the worst possible spot for a development of this kind. As has been stated throughout this call, Alma is the worst possible developer for a project of this kind. We're calling on city planning to protect the people of these communities. Our joint neighborhoods up and down the peninsula are united in asking to stop this development. We concur that this is a bad proposal for all of our communities, and we ask that you use the most robust investigation of what is being proposed to protect our interests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for providing the testimony and for, for everyone participating today um, who are sharing important insights into the analysis that will be conducted to evaluate the proposal. All right. Um, Margaret Powers was the last of our registered speakers, but we do recognize that we have quite a number of folks that have dialed in via phone. Um, so if any dial-in participant uh, speakers who are present uh, did not register and would like to provide testimony at this point, if you could please uh, dial star nine on your phone to indicate that you would like to provide testimony here. Again, that's star nine on your telephone. We'll just give folks a minute to indicate that they would wish to provide testimony if you're dialing in via phone. Again, that's star nine. Okay, it does not look like that we're getting any indication that our dial-in uh, phone participants are, um, are wishing to testify. Um, and we have reached the end of our registered speakers list. Uh, we do recognize that some folks were not in the Zoom um, or may have not had a chance to register. Um, so at this time, we are going to take a brief five minute pause. So if we can go um, a, few, a couple of slides ahead. Let's not start the timer yet while I just give a few instructions. Um, so if anyone had difficulty registering or is just now joining the meeting and did not yet have a chance to provide their testimony, uh, please follow the instructions here. Um, register to speak via nyc.gov slash NYC engage under the upcoming meetings tab. There will be an icon called city planning scoping meeting for 10610 Shorefront Parkway rezoning and LSGD. That's the preferred method to register, but you're also able to register via phone. Um, or if you have technical difficulties, please um, dial any of these phone numbers and use the information at the bottom of this screen uh, with the meeting ID and the participant password one if you need assistance. Um, so at this point, we will take a five minute pause and be back here at about 4.03 p.m. Uh, so we'll start our timer and we will be back in just a few minutes to hear from any remaining speakers. Thank you all for your participation today.
All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the remote public scoping meeting for the 10610 Shorefront Parkway rezoning and large scale general development proposal. Again, for the record, the seeker number is 24DCP098Q. My name is Stephanie Shalou, Director of the Environmental and Assessment and Review Division of the New York City Department of City Planning. We are currently in part three of our public scoping meeting, where members of the public are invited to speak for up to three minutes. Um, we took a short break to allow anyone who may have had technical difficulties or who had not yet registered to speak uh, to register. At this time, we did not receive any new registrants, uh, nor are any new participants that have um, that had not yet registered joined the meeting. Um, we do still have a couple of folks in the Zoom via telephone. Um, so at this point, if you are in via telephone and you would like to speak, if you can go ahead and dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that you wish to provide testimony. All right, we have one speaker phone number ending in 761. Uh, we will, um, if you could go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself, we can go ahead and hear your testimony and please remember to introduce yourself for the record. Ah, hello. Hi, welcome. Stop, we'll see. Uh, this is Barbara Berger. Um, I have lived here in Surfside for 38 years, and I have seen the quality of life and the buildings go steadily downward since Alma took over. They, um, they don't fix anything that is uh, problematic. Well, or they do half measures. And uh, one time my neighbor had water coming in uh, his apartment. And um, what they did when he pointed this out to them afterwards was they went ahead and painted the area around where the water was coming in. As you can imagine, this did nothing to help it. Alma is not a responsible landlord. They should not be given permission to, um, to build new buildings and have to care for them because uh, they don't hire sufficient staff. The, the guys that work here, and they work hard, and they just, uh, they have too much to do. They're always under stress, and it's never enough to keep the buildings looking good and, um, and clean. There's always garbage blowing around due to some problem, I think, with the old um, uh, mesh that keeps the garbage in where the incinerators used to be and things fly out of there and land on the lawn and just stay there. There's never really an attempt to keep the, the grounds looking good as well as the buildings. Um, they are very irresponsible and uh, do not give enough attention to the, um, the tenants. Also, their bookkeeping people are terrible. There's often um, mistakes on the rent bills that we receive and uh, usually in their favor, um, I, I don't know what their problem is, but they, they are not good landlords. So, Your time uh, is up. 
You can conclude your okay. remarks. Okay. Well, thank you for listening. I appreciate it, Stephanie. Thank and you. Thanks for your testimony yeah. and for sticking with us today to provide it. Uh, we appreciate your time. All right. Um, that does bring us to the end of our registered speakers and those who have indicated that they wish to provide testimony. Um, is there anyone else who is in the meeting at this point who wishes to provide testimony? All right, we're seeing one person with a raised hand. We'll go ahead and um, allow that person to speak and we will register you um, after this meeting. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record. Okay, my name is John Signorelli, and I'm a resident of the uh, Rockaway. Uh, I want to mention uh, a few things. Uh, I did leave the meeting and come back. Uh, on the commercial buildings, there was never uh, information that I know of, of the height of, of all the buildings that they plan to uh, build or propose, or their residential residence above them how many stores are planned to rent and all the commercial businesses along the perimeter and any within the complex. Uh, how is rubbish removal going to take place? How is customer parking for these commercial buildings going to take place? Uh, as I know, there's going to be a hotel or maybe more than one. Uh, what's the height of that building for this hotel? What's the number of rooms? They're going to have eating areas uh, within the building. What's the, what's the expected occupancy rate? Uh, is it going to have dedicated parking for these hotels or this one hotel? Again, rubbish removal, location of the rubbish removal, etc. Will these uh, tall buildings and even the commercial buildings uh, have emergency generators for each of those buildings that are 23, 24 stories high? Uh, will the commercial buildings also have emergency generators? Uh, they are in flood zone area. And I understand the parking is going to be underground for 1,800 parking spots, which takes away from the drainage if there's ever a flooding, because the land was supposed to absorb the uh, water as best it, as it could. Um, the community lacks all the essential services presently, which is schools, police, fire, emergency evacuation, uh, hospitals, parking and transportation. Uh, there needs more to be done. And with the traffic that the commercial uh, establishments will bring in, besides the residents will be there, which is, I'm told is maybe five to 6,000 new residences, uh, how, how many cars do they expect? One or two per, per resident? Uh, it's gonna cause an enormous parking problem in the streets. And the commercial establishments will also bring in more cars in to the area, which will cause more congestion and potential hazards. So I'd like to thank you for my uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, sticking with us. And uh, we see you, you had already registered to speak. We called your name previously. Um, so no, no need to register again. Um, all right. Again, this does bring us to the end of our of our registered speakers um, and those that are in the Zoom room wishing to provide testimony. Um, if anyone else wishes to speak at this time, please indicate so. All right. Um, at this time, we will now move to close the meeting. If we can go to our slide uh, with the written testimony information. Um, if anyone did have difficulty providing testimony or was otherwise not able to attend today, um, please do remember that you, we welcome our written comments um, and written testimony that can be mailed to us or emailed to us at the information shown here on the screen. Our mailing address, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. 
or our email address 24DCP098Q underscore DL at planning.nyc.gov. Written comments will be accepted through 5 p.m. Monday, April 15th, 2024. Um, with that, it is 4.13 p.m. and this public scoping meeting is now closed. Thank you so much for all of your participation today and we wish you a, a great afternoon. Thanks.